Hello, everyone, and welcome to Politics and Prose Live. We're here tonight with Iris Krasno, the author of Camp Girls. Uh, before we get started, I'm just going to do some very, very quick housekeeping. I want to point everyone's attention to the green button at the bottom of the screen. If you click on that, you can go and purchase Camp Girls from politicsandprose.com. I encourage everyone to do that. We really could use your support right now, and it's an excellent read, so I highly recommend it. Also, if anyone has a question tonight, there is an ask a question feature below. Um, you can click there, ask your question. You can also read other people's questions and vote on the question that you'd like to see answered the most. So we're going to answer those in the, the second half of the program. And without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Iris Krasno, who is a longtime professor at American University and the best-selling author of seven books. Camp Girls chronicles the lessons learned and deep friendship made during her many summers at Camp Agawak in the North Woods of Wisconsin, where she still works, is what she calls the oldest counselor with the youngest heart. Camp Girls is a nostalgic feast that highlights how the character traits formed at camp, such as courage, independence, and resilience, and the enduring friendships made in rustic cabins last a lifetime. So please help me in welcoming Iris Cresno. Hi, everybody. Um, so there's 175 people around the campfire right now. And I'm gonna just tell you that you can't really see this, but I have my Camp Agawak shirt on um and thank you for traveling far and wide to see me you went from your kitchens to your living rooms some of you might still be in the bathroom um i know i traveled really far to see you and thank you politics and prose seven books and this is the seventh time i've been with you all so i'm going to tell you um why i wrote this book and what i learned uh, i'm 65 years old i know i only look 64 but I am 65 and um, I still go to Camp Agawak uh, for girls in Minocqua, Wisconsin. Uh, my sister, brother and I started going to camp uh, when I was four and she was five and I think he was three. We went to a JCC camp outside of Chicago and then I went to Travel Air Day camp. And then at eight years old, I started to go to Camp Agawak for girls. And the way that I organized this book was according to character traits that happened over many summers at camp. I went to Camp Agawak from age eight to 18. And my chapters are independence, community, ambition, versatility, nature, responsibility, and tradition. And at 65 years old, I can tell you that the best of who I am the most mischievous of who I am, the most courageous of who I am, the most humble of who I am, the funniest of who I am, and the most hopeful of who I am was formed during those 10 summers at Camp Agawak from age eight to 18. And, you know, really camp for me, and I know for many of the people around that campfire right now, there's 182 of you. And thank you so much for coming. And thank you, Politics and Pros, for making this happen. So many of you went to camp, or your kids went to camp, or your mothers or grandmothers went to camp. But even if you didn't go to summer camp, everyone watching this today and tonight has a circle of friends that are your history holders. So this camp book that I love so much, I really loved writing this, um, is about camp life, but it's really about deep friendships that are our history holders. When you go to camp or when you have childhood friends, these people are sisters and brothers born not of blood, but of history, love, and loyalty. So imagine this. I'm eight years old. My sister, Fran, is nine years old. Uh, we're from Oak Park, Illinois. Our parents drive to Chicago, 1963, and they put us on a train, an overnight train. No, there were no cell phones, no emails. And my sister and I climb on the train and we're in our uniforms. We were wearing navy blue pants and white shirts and navy blue cardigans because it was a uniform camp then. And I just remember the two of us were sitting there and in the darkened dusk through the window, we're waving goodbye to mom and dad. We're eight years old and nine years old and we go on an overnight train 
to Woodruff, Wisconsin, which was right near Minocqua, Wisconsin, which is where Camp Agawak was and still is and is about to turn 100 years old. It's so good that something's older than me. And so my sister and I, and she reminded me of this, and I just, I love, love, love this. My sister and I uh, slept in a berth in bunks uh, going to Woodruff, Wisconsin, and I was on the top bunk and she was on the bottom bunk. And we always said to each other at night, we, we shared a bedroom. We always said to each other at night, good night and pleasant dreams. And she'd say good night and pleasant dreams. And then she said to me, drop your arm over the bunk. And she touched my fingers. And I think we touched our fingers until we both fell asleep. So my first chapter is called Independence. And I can tell you that independence comes early for an eight and nine year old who go to camp and you went for four weeks first session, your parents came for a day or two, and then we went for another four weeks. And independence comes early. And this book is about character traits that come from the camp experience that bolster you throughout a lifetime. Think about what we're going through right now. If we didn't have this independence, and many of you who didn't go to camp, somewhere in your life, you became independent. Somewhere in your life, you went away somewhere, in, in, or even maybe it happened in college. But independence comes very, very early for an eight and nine-year-old. And I can tell you, at the age of 65, um, and you know I, we've lost both parents all of us have lost friends um we live right now in an unthinkable unthinkable times where if we couldn't have self-reliance and independence we'd never survive and thrive and i really thank camp for that i thank camp also for resilience in fact so many qualities that we need now during, um, I didn't want to use the C word yet. I will uh, later. I'm sure I'll get questions whether camp's going to open. But um, at camp, you're thrust, you, you sleep in a rustic bunk, bunk, you're thrust into a cabin with a group of strangers. There's no mommy to call in, in case there's a cabin squabble. You got a deal. And one of the loveliest parts of my life right now, and I was asked earlier, um, if you love camp so much, why didn't you write this book 20 years ago? Well, I skipped 40 years. I went to Camp Agwa from 8 to 18. And then at our camp's 85th reunion, the owner of the camp had read one of my books. And I was on the co uh, there was a picture of me on the cover of that book. And I said, I wrote that book. And Mary said to me, and I said, and I got my literary start at Camp Agawak. And she said, what do you mean you got your literary start at Camp Agawak? And I said, well, at, at Agawak, at the Camp Magazine. She said, we don't have that magazine. It turned out the, the magazine had died like 25 years earlier. And in the same breath, I said, why don't I? And she said, would you ever want to? And the next summer, I went to Camp Agawak at age 59. So this would be, and I hope it still is, my seventh summer. In between this time, my husband and I had four sons. Camp Agwalk for Girls does not take sons. So they went to Camp Racket Lake for Boys in upstate New York, and I worked at their camp while they were campers. So I have really had camp at the spine of my life for my whole life. And, you know, those of you who are non-campers, when I talk about the community of camp and my community, I talk to a camp girl almost every day. Um, and, and even throughout those 40 years where we weren't together, um, I, I still count them as my deepest, truest friends. In school and as, as youngsters, we make sequential series of friends. We go to grammar school and, and then we go on to high school and sometimes we go to middle school. So you make groups of friends, then you make other groups of friends and then you make other groups of friends and many of us keep some of our college friends. Camp is an unbroken timeline. The girls that I went to Camp Agawak with in 1960s and 1970s, I'm still really, really good friends with. There's a song that we sing, I'm not gonna sing, don't worry anybody, but it goes, I'm strong for Camp Agawak, the girls are the fairest and we'll be together forever. Um, and, you know, when we sang that song as kids, um, no matter the weather, we'll all stick together. 
And when we sang that song as kids, nobody could ever imagine that in 2020, we're still stuck together. When I went back to camp seven summers ago, my girlfriends, my cabin mates, the cabin mates that I slept with in cold bunks, one smelly bathroom, uh, there was running water, you know, Coke or a nickel those times. Um, but I just, I remember so many things about those early days. I remember fizzies, um, you know, now we get together, we drink Tito's, not fizzies, but that's another story. Um, and we don't drink at camp, but we're, we're still such tight friends. And, you know, together we have been through births of children, births of grandchildren. I don't have grandchildren yet. Um, but, you know, cancer surviving. We've had friends who've lost siblings. We've had a friend who lost a son. We've been through hip replacements, cancer. And, you know, we are the girls that started together at eight years old. And through every passage of our lives, it's an unbroken timeline. And even if we go back to camp only for seven or eight weeks, it's not, it's 24 seven, you know, you wake up together shivering in sweat clothes and you get in your, your, your blue and whites, um, you go to flag raising and then you eat together and then you go to all your activities together. And that community is so tight and so strong and it becomes your history holder. Again, non-campers in our, now we have a 190, we have 190 people now. People who didn't go to camp tell me that they liked this book so much because it reminded them of their college tribe, of people they went to college with who they're still really, really, really good friends with. And I think my college roommate, Amy, is on uh, right now. Uh, and she's still my friend and we met like 100 years ago. One of the things that I really, you know, again, all these virtues from camp um, and, and the friendships, they run so deep. One thing I love about camp now is there, there's no technology. There's no cell phones. The girls are, there's no screens. They're not out posting each other on Instagram. And, you know, girls who, and again, it's a girls, I, I, this could be called boy, boys, uh, camp boys too, but campers who may not be the most popular children in their schools. Maybe they're not the coolest. They don't have the coolest clothes. They don't go on the coolest vacations. They don't post their prettiest poses. Um, I just find that that quirky, cerebral, different science kid who comes to camp, everybody finds something that they're good at at camp. And, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and experiences, but what we share as human beings is we want to love and we want to be loved, and we want to feel worthy. And there is something for everyone at camp. You know, and I also um, think about this, and I know that when I wrote the book, the way I wrote the book is I interviewed probably 100 people. A lot of them were ex-Agawa campers, but they came from many different camps and many different ages. And one of my favorite interviews was with an Agawa girl who wouldn't tell me her age, but she told me that she went to camp in the 40s during the World War II. So I figured that she's not 50. Um, and she was telling me, first of all, I, I called her on the phone and she said to me, were you a white or a blue? Our camp was divided into two teams, the blue team and the white team. And once you're a blue, you're always a blue. And once you're white, you're always a white. And I was a blue, I was actually blue team captain, humble brag. And I know that only a camp girl could understand this or a camper. And that remains one of the highlights of my life is just being the blue team captain. So this woman who was probably in her early 80s, maybe even more, she said to me immediately, were you a blue or a white? And I, she went to camp in the 40s. And I said, I was a blue. And immediately she started singing the white team fight song. And I, you know, I could tell that she didn't like me as much when she found out I was blue and especially the captain. But she said something to me that I'll never forget. And I've gotten similar letters from octogenarians and people in their 70s and 80s. And this woman told me this. She said, you know, I've been to Paris. I've been to London. I've been to South Africa. I've been to Australia. My husband and I are going to Iceland. I've been all over the world. But when I want to go to sleep at night... I close my eyes and I picture myself in that cove on Blue Lake with my fishing pole 
sitting there in silence in my blue bathing suit, just waiting for a fish, and I go right to sleep. And then she said to me, you know, I was the best canoer at Agawak, and I still have my canoe with a big C on it because I got an award with my name on it. And that kind of memory, oh, I do have something to show you. So this is my yellow cap. Now, this was an advanced cap that I got in 1970. Why do I keep this? And it still has the writing in it from our waterfront director, whose name was Beverly Vandernick, and we called her Beaver. I don't think we'd call her that right now. But I also have, and these are just things you keep at camp. This is my horse show trophy, one in 1970. And I keep this by my desk where I am now, and I look at that silver stallion, and I think about winning the horse show my last year of camp and trying every single year to be a better rider, to go over the jump easier, not to get tossed on my butt, to just try and try and try and try and finally win a horse show. And this is so emblematic of what happens at camp. There's so much failure that happens. There's, you know, you don't hit a bullseye at first in archery. I mean, you don't make it over a jump with the horse. You don't always get along with all the girls in your cabin. Um, you, you can't always do a flip off the diving board. You can't always do the breaststroke. But through trial and error and persistence and hard work and tenacity, you do it. And, you know, and we cheer each other on. It's a real sisterhood and a real brotherhood that's so tight. Um, and, you know, when I think about going to camp, I probably would not have been as happy of a camper if my sister wasn't there because she really, really encouraged me. And so many of my friends that I'm still still attached to and who are on this um, politics and prose um, live broadcast right now, so many of us took our camp skills and made it our profession. I wrote for Agalog at age eight and I discovered my love of writing. That is really where I first got published. And I wrote under the stars. I wrote under towering birch and pine trees and my whole soul opened up. You know, when you're in a classroom and you're writing and you're under a teacher's steely gaze and there's fluorescent lights, it's not the same. And that whole freedom and that whole unleashing of my heart and, and play and friends really was the, uh, was the spark that started a very long career. And what a joy it is for me right now to be at camp and to see and to run a camp, the same activity. We sit at rickety picnic benches. I give the girls yellow pads. Uh, they write, they do handwriting. And many of their mothers say to me, you know, because I, I make them, I tell them they have to write letters home twice a week, but sometimes they can be emails. And I tell the kids that you have to um, write, you know, handwrite. And at Visitor's Day, some of the parents say to me, um, you know, it's the first time I've ever seen my child's handwriting. And there's something about, and I'm, I'm sure there's educators on, now we're at 195, um, it, you know, that are listening to me that know that to take a pen to paper, that's such a direct route from your heart and your head, and you're not just clacking away. So I talked about how camp is, you disconnect. You're not on screen time, you're on real time. The friendships formed at camp are face to face. You gotta work it out. And it really at a time when childhood depression and anxiety, and when the kids are taking SATs and ACTs, you know, four and five times, and you don't just walk on a team, you have to make a team. At a time when all this competition starts so early for children, it is such a relief to go to camp and to just chill. And, you know, when I see, when we went to camp, um, there was no Title IX, and we were athletes. We didn't, you know, I didn't get to play t-ball like my brother. I went to ballet and hated it. But when we went to camp, and I interviewed one of our former campers who's now in her 70s, Nancy Fleischman, who described being athletic wasn't cool when she was growing up in the 50s. You know, it's not cool to be an athlete. You were supposed to be prim and petite and everything. And Nancy is beautiful and tall and athletic. And when she came to camp, 
And when I came to camp, boy, we were athletes. We learned it all. And we learned 10 strokes and six dives and how to play volleyball and how to be strong, how to be strong. Um, and, you know, those life lessons just really, really last forever. I also want to talk about tradition. Um, we, the same thing happens at the same time every day and every week at camp. I mean, we go to different activities, but, you know, there's blue and white competition two or three times a week. Um, there's six activity periods in a day. We eat breakfast at the same time, lunch at the same time, dinner at the same time. We go to bed at the same time, but really we don't go to bed. We whisper under our covers with flashlights and we share our deepest, deepest secrets. I'm thinking about being 10 and 12 and those late night whispering sessions and talking to my girlfriends and can't, my cabin mates and telling them things that I never had told anyone. You know, nobody knows this about us. Cabin mates share the most sacred experiences, the hardest, some of the saddest, some of the best. And we're just, we're tied for life. You know, I kept saying that we're born not of blood, but of history and loyalty and tradition. One of my sharpest memories also growing up um, and going to camp, and really I feel it now, is um, our family was very fortunate in that my parents stayed together. My mother had us on a very strict schedule. We ate together. We went to bed at the same time. But many children come to camp and they've never done a sit down family dinner. Uh, you know, dinner is whatever is in the refrigerator. Uh, maybe there is um, a separation, which, you know, 43% of families, um, there's a divorce and, and kids do okay. Um, but maybe they're, they just want to be in one place. And then I see these kids come to camp and, and I, this, even this last summer, this 10 year old said to me, you know, Iris, this is the only time I sit down and have like, you know, a dinner with a family, a family dinner. And so that kind of tradition and routine and predictability is really at the root of, of everything for me. I know. Um, so raising four sons, um, I always had them on a schedule and, you know, I don't think I was always the best mom and they probably thought I was a little bit of a hovering helicopter mom, but they always knew when, what to expect and when to expect it. And I would say the rhythm of camp and the beauty of the tradition of camp and the rituals and the predictability have really just bolstered me through all of life. So right now we're going through um, a very difficult time in life, very challenging. Um, a lot of people uh, are complaining to me about very trivial, what I say is trivial, like, gosh, how am I going to get my hair done? Well, as you can see, that's not one of my worries. I always look like this. But when I think about how fortunate um, we are, uh, campers and and hopefully everyone and now we're at 199 I wanted to get to 200 you know if you have families and you have friends all those character traits I was talking about that come from a community um, which is connectiveness collaboration friendship love support independence self-reliance you know we have each other and ironically as much as I love being disconnected at Camp Agwalk and not having, um, not having screen time, and there, there is no cell phones. The oldest girls get their cell phones for two hours on Sundays, and boy, do they go at it. You know, they get it like from right after lunch, there's rest hour, so they get it during rest hour. But right now, screens are saving us. Right now, and I know that I could, I can feel it around this uh, now we're at 200 campfire that everyone is on Zoom. Or, I mean, right now you're with me because you're not at a restaurant, you're not at the theater, you, you know, you're here. Um, and we're so connected because of technology. And I just thank God right now for technology. I'm an American University professor. Today was my last day. I taught um, on Blackboard, like a little checkerboard, like the Brady Bunch. 
And it's been the only way to communicate. One of my best friends from camp, Terry Schwartz, who lives in Denver, um, you know, I've probably seen her, I want to say 10 times since 1970. But when I talk to her and we FaceTime and she takes her FaceTime, she takes her iPhone and she skims it. She's got a ton of tattoos and a lot of ear pierces now, which is so um, unusual for Terry because she's such a spiritual and good girl, no drinks, vegan. Um, but she's, she has this little tattoo of a pink ribbon uh, that she put right where her port used to go uh, through her two bouts of breast cancer. And when I talk to Terry and she shows me pictures of her four grandchildren and I show her pictures of my four sons and my grand dog, um, yes, I have a grand dog, um, Holly. Um, she looks just like my son. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I show her pictures, like I feel as connected to Terry and, and I laugh so hard. My husband always knows when I'm talking to a camp girl because we have gray hair. Well, nobody else has gray hair, but uh, we most of us have gray hair uh, and teenage hearts. And I just feel that we have this timeline that's unbroken. And when I look at these people and these women that I've known for 50 and plus years, it's like my whole life shoots through me. And I think that, um, you know, what do we want in life? Um, we want that unbroken timeline. Life is so much like a patchwork quilt. You know, you live here. I, I've been a journalist in Chicago and Dallas. Uh, I've lived in Colorado. I lived in California. Uh, I've lived in the Washington area for now uh, 35 years. It's home. Um, but, you know, we just bounce around so much. The thing that has been constant in my life has been camp. That is my place where I go. And that is a place that houses my whole history. And for camp, for you non-campers there in the audience, now 201, who's counting, um, you have a place too. You might have a place where your family went every summer to the mountains, to the woods, to a lake, a place you keep going to every summer. Maybe you have a, a second home in Bethany or Rehoboth or somewhere in upstate New York. And it's a place you meet every year and it's like same time next year, and that's your unbroken timeline. And I want to take some questions now. I said I'd cut myself off at seven, at still 728. There's one thing um, I want to talk about just for two minutes, and, and that is um, right now in these times, it's terrible, and there's so much fear but one thing we learned at camp, and, I, and I'm thinking about this camp trip we took where we were portaging these very, very heavy canoes through a thunderstorm. And uh, we were led by our, our tripping man. He wasn't really tripping, but he was called the tripping man, Al Gabrilska. And he was like six feet five and built like Paul Bunyan. And he kept saying, carry on girls, carry on. And I just remember we got on the lake and we were hovering in this little cove and lightning flashes were going off and we kept singing, uh, you know, we're Agwalk girls, that's who are we in Wisconsin, yes siree. And that, that song and that joy, it really dissolved so much fear. So I really hope that in your uh, social distancing and in this unthinkable, scary time that uh, you're having that beautiful time to, to deepen connections with your friends and with your families, and most importantly, with yourselves. I mean, there's a lot of self-discovery that's going on right now during Corona chaos. Um, and I, I think about those times when now that I'm, you know, the oldest counselor at Camp Agawak, I can pretty much do what I want. I don't live in a cabin with kids. I live with the nurse. Uh, which is great, uh, you know, in case <laughs> in case I can't get out of the bathtub. Uh, but, you know, um, there's so many times in the morning and the dawn, I'll get in a kayak and I'll just go out on this glistening lake like glass and I'll just be alone. It'll be me and maybe a couple loons. And if you've ever heard the cry of the loon, it's so beautiful. And it's just me. And those are the times, as much as I love the cacophony 
of 260 girls in each session, that time just of reflection to think, who am I? What do I want? Uh, what else do I want to do in this one short life I've been granted? That's the beauty of camp. And that is the beauty of now, too. The beauty of now is we're forced to be still. You're forced to be here with me. You can't go to any restaurants. And if you can, you're in a line. Uh, you could go to Trader Joe's. Um, but hopefully this was more fun than Trader Joe's. So anyway, Tom, come back. Are there any questions for me? Thank you so much, Iris. I think I, I speak um, for everyone around the campfire, but I was saying that that was very moving and very powerful. Um, just want to remind everyone that you can purchase Camp Girls by clicking on the green button at the bottom of the screen. And we really encourage everyone to do that. Uh, it's going to really be really great for uh, both Iris and politics and pros. Um, well, I want to just say one thing about that. So you should buy this book for all your besties, you know, because like this is really a book about best friends. It's about um, the, like that girl you went to college with or that boy that you went to Boy Scout camp with. It's it's really about our tribes that that are everlasting. And, you know, when I read and I, it's my favorite book I wrote, too. Anyway, I digress. Tom, go go for it. Sure. We have a lot of good questions too. And if anyone has any more questions, be sure to put them in the ask a question uh, spot at the bottom there. This comes from Lynn Lipton. She says, I'm 80 and was 10 when I first became a camper. I've been to three different camps. There is a difference in those camps. What qualities do you think make some camps so much better than others? Let's face it, they aren't all great. She says, somehow my first camp, seven years, will always be the most special place in my heart. And what's her name, Lynn? Lynn. And Lynn is 80. And so the reason I don't, I don't, I mean, Lynn would have to answer that question, but the answer is the people she connected with at that first camp. She felt, you know, when I said that all we want is to love and be loved and to feel worthy, she was with a circle of, of campers that, that made her feel like her best self. And, and that's what, it's not about archery. It's not about, you know, trampoline. It's really about people. And, um, you know, you grow to love the people. And it, in repeated summers at Ag Walk, you know, we became so close. And you don't like everyone and everyone doesn't like you. But what it it's so funny how it turns out, Tom and everybody else, uh, we're at 202. <laughs> I love counting. I'm not really very good at math, though. But what I can say is that, you know, repeated, it, the, the repeating of the summers, and, and a lot of people change camps. You know, I maybe Lynn at 80 is thinking, why didn't I stay at that other camp, right? Anyway, thanks for that question. I have a, a couple comments um, from a group of um, five girls from um, a camp. They've been camp friends for over 65 years, since 1954, um, from Camp Chinoa, and they're all watching tonight, and they want to sing some songs later. Okay, let's wait till we get some questions. But and what what might happen is that they might need to sing after the broadcast. But I love that they're still friends. This is my whole talk, right? They're, they they get together and they know every word of every song, and tell them thank you, thank you, girls. Um, and this is a related with singing. Someone wants to know. Uh, Lori wants to know. Did you sing the song, make new friends, but keep the old one is silver and the other is gold? So I love that. We all sing that. And that is what unify. We sing that at the end of our campfires, make new friends, but keep the old one is silver and the other is gold. And we cross arms and we sing that and we all sing that. And that is the, the unifying camp song. And it's, it's a very old song, actually. You know, camps are old. I didn't even get to get into that. You know, our camp's about to celebrate its 100th birthday. A lot of camps were started, a lot of camps that are 100 years old were started by immigrants from Europe. A lot of them were Jewish. Um, but interestingly, the first camps in the United States were started by the Young Men's Christian Association at the turn of the century. So those camps are older than these older traditional camps. And camps are changing right now um, thanks to the American Camp Association, much more diverse uh, and much more uh, uh, accessible 
uh, to everyone. The mission of the American Camp Association is any child who wants to go to camp should have that advantage of going to camp. And there's just great scholarship funds going on right now with all camps. We have a question from Karen. She asks, was Girl Scout camp the same experience? So I was a Girl Scout and I went to Girl Scout camp for two nights, but that's a great question because studies show, studies by the American Camp Association show whether you go to camp for two weeks or you go for eight weeks, the takeaways are very similar. Children become independent, they become strong, they become collaborative, they become more resilient, they become more of everything. And, and those qualities, and the reason I wrote this book now, and I didn't write it when I was 18, when I left camp, is because you don't realize all this stuff until you're older. You don't realize who you are. At 65, I realized again, as I started out, that really the best of me and, you know, and the most mischievous and some of my faults and some of my courage, a lot of my courage, came from those early days. And Girl Scouts get that in two weeks. Boy Scouts. Tom, you went to Boy Scout camp, you told me. I did. And you loved it. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a great experience. Any questions? We have a question from S. Jacob Scher. They ask, what was more intense, summer camp or life on 38th Street with four boys under four? Intense. Now that's a good word. Um, so what was more, when my husband and I uh, got married, within the first four years of our marriage, we had four kids under the age of three. Twins made that happen. And those were very intense years. And I, I, I love that question um, because I guess I always felt like I was running a summer camp or, or at a summer camp. Right now we live in a, in a like a shingle style cabin in the woods near a river. It's messy. It's really messy now because the kids are home. Um, and it just feels campy. So I think the intense, I, I mean, I like intensity. I guess that, you know, I, this question's making me think a lot because when I was working on this book, a lot of people that I interviewed said, I want to talk to you about camp. Not a lot. But some said to me, I hated camp. And I would say, why did you hate camp? And, and the reasons they didn't like camp were the same reasons I loved camp. It's so intense. You don't stop. You go from activity to activity. You know, and, and to this day, and I, I think about this, every time I hear the screech or the slam of a screen door, I, I'm, you know, I have this deja vu feeling of going in and out of our cabins and changing for riding and then going back and changing for swimming and going back and changing for hiking and going back and changing for sailing. And so that intensity, I really loved. And I also loved competition. You know, I think that the competition between teams really makes you a better person. You become a humble loser, a humble winner. And you become a, um, you know, a, a very empathetic um, when somebody loses and you, you go back to the cabin. Some of the girls were on one team. Some of the girls were on the other team and you got to make it work. So I think you learn a lot from games and, and losing and winning and trying again and again and again. Uh, so I love intensity, as you can tell. And, and camp is intense. Um, I can't even imagine camp not running this summer. And I'm sure there's a question like that in the docket, Tom. Is there or is there not? It's actually what? the next question, yeah. Okay, hey, go for it. Uh, Teresa asks, are we having camp this summer? And what, what will we do if we do not? Well, um, I am not the CDC, nor am I Anthony Fauci. I'm um, de definitely not Donald Trump. Um, so here's the deal. It's still a what if. Um, what's likely going to happen, and again, there's no, it, there will be a definitive answer uh, very soon. Uh, everyone, all the 2,600 members or 2,500 plus members of the American Camp Association are all talking about this. A lot of it depends, and, and some camps 
may make different decisions than other camps, but the guidelines will uni uniformly be, uh, do you have the proper facilities? Do you have the proper medical staff? And, um, you know, everybody would need to be tested and there it would just be, it will look like a different camp. Um, kids, uh, one of the greatest parts about being a counselor, I didn't even talk about this, uh, was that you go out at night uh, and you get to socialize with other camps like the boys camps. And, you know, there's something that happens in the woods. I'll tell you, it's like magic. Um, and the counselors will not be able to go and it will be a very, it would be like old fashioned camp. You know, uh, there will be no inner camp competitions probably. Um, and again, we are at the mercy of the moment right now. And I know in our 204 uh, people in around the campfire right now that many of you are thinking, I hope my kids get to go to camp or you're like me and thinking, I can't believe camp won't run. In the 50s, um, during the polio epidemic, camps thrived because the parents wanted to get their kids out of the uh, cities and into the woods. And it was an epidemic, not a pandemic. Uh, one of the challenges of camp now is many of our staffs come from overseas uh, or Mexico. Uh, and um, that's uh, going to be uh, very difficult. So I would say that within the next week or two, um, we're going to know some definitive answers. Some camps are going to open late. Some camps are not going to be able to open at all. And I respect, I mean, if I was a mom right now, which I am, but my kids are, they don't go to camp anymore. Um, I would trust the judgment if I went to a camp and, and my kid had a wonderful experience there. And, and the leadership of that camp felt comfortable opening July 6th for, for one session uh, and, and felt that they were properly uh, equipped to deal with any kind of health issues, I would freely send my kid to that camp. Other moms and dads will make different, uh, different decisions. This is also an opportunity. In fact, I just wrote an article about this. If camp doesn't run, or if you choose not to send a child to camp, how do you create or resurrect a camp spirit in your home? Um, how do you foster independence and a sense of adventure and a sense of resilience and a sense of all of that good stuff that comes from the camp experience in your home? And, um, you know, I could go on and on about it. When our kids were li really little, I ran a camp in our house for the kids in our neighborhood kids. And I would do activities like wash mommy's car, read about the Philippines, make apple pie. Um, but, you know, I think that overall, and I'll answer that briefly, is keeping children on a schedule is really something that camp gives us is that there's just nonstop activities. Um, and uh, so the jury's still out. Everybody's talking about this and everybody's waiting for guidelines from the CDC, the World Health Organization, on how this um, virus is going to be contained. This could be a year with no camp. This could be a year with late openings. I can tell you this, <clears throat> once a camper, always a camper. And if your kid or if you're a counselor right now doesn't get to go to camp this summer, let's say you're the kid, that child is going to be the first to uh, run to the bus uh, the summer of 2021 and start again. I know that this would be my seventh summer back at Camp Agawak. And if for some reason um, I'm not able to go to camp, um, we're just going to have to have camp here in Annapolis, Maryland. So come on down. Other questions? Yep, we have one from Susan. She'd like to know, what was it like being with uh, just the girls? How much contact did you have with the boys camp? At what period of time? Now, as a married woman or as a younger person? <laughs> I, you know. I don't think she specified. I, I think she means when you were think, uh, a yeah, younger person, so, yeah. Well, you're gonna have to buy the book because, and I'm, I'm telling you, because I, I talk about this a lot. Some of my best friends from camp actually married people 
that they met at camp socials when they were 15 and 16. Many of my friends had their first kisses at camp uh, with the boys' camps. Uh, you know, camp, those woods and nature, it, it, it brings out a lot of things. And uh, obviously love of nature um, and just being outdoors, as I talked about writing under the stars, uh, dwarfed by towering pines and birch, um, really unleashes your soul. You know, nights, uh, cool nights, and it gets so cold at night, you know, and you're all in your lum your wool checked lumber jackets. And, you know, it's just, uh, you do definitely uh, make friends with um, counselors from the other camps. And you have socials, like we now, have camp socials almost every other week with one of the one of the surrounding camps. Um, if camp doesn't run, there will probably not be those kind of uh, socials. And so I know the girls really look forward uh, to uh, those socials. And a lot of their brothers go to the neighboring boys camps. I know we have a brother camp called Camp Kawaga and we do intramurals with them and we do ski shows with them and we do a lot of things. Uh, with them. You know, I have all boys, I mentioned that. Um, and I did never had same sex education. I always went to uh, except for camp. And there's something really powerful about being in a same sex environment. And I'm not being political or anything, but it's something that I notice. And I do notice that the girls, uh, are you know silly and wild and 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 more unkempt, which is a good thing. You know, look at look at me. <laughs> uh, you know that you 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 become you become raw and real, uh, and I think that that's that's good. And and you're able to really develop on your own without feeling I don't know just feeling true to your own self. Um, and that's that's why I think the friendships are so deep. And I know um, in our audience right now, uh, there's people who went to co-ed camps and had great, great, great experience. I interviewed a woman uh, named Heidi who went to Surprise Lake Camp, and she met Bruce, the waterfront director, and you know married him. Uh, one of our uh, head staff, Denise, uh, met her husband because uh, he was the tripping man at our camp. Uh, and they, you know, they have three kids now and they both work at camp. So, you know, one thing as I'm talking about this, I realize there's a lot of us older people that still work at camp. I mean, it's really, and people say to me, some people say to me, how could you go to camp? You know, what is it? And I think that it's something so deep inside and that you can't even really explain it. I can tell you that one of the things I love about camp is I get about 60 hugs a day at camp from little girls and big girls and just it's a huggy kind of place. And, you know, if you went up and down the streets in Washington, D.C. and hugged everyone, you'd get, well, right now you definitely would not be doing that, but you'd get arrested. Um, and, you know, you see uh, girls loping together, arms looped like they're an octopus, um, you know, just singing silly songs and you're not saying, oh, that's so weird that you're holding hands or it's just very pure uh, and, and, and real and spontaneous. And, you know, I use the word raw and real a lot when I think about, uh, about camp. So we have a question here. I'll just find it from Karen Franklin. She says, at Camp Agawak, the director's wife had a terrible disability. Do you think that had an influence on us? And what do you think it taught us? Well, Karen, and Karen was in one of my sister's cabins. And I, I love that she wrote that. And I write about this in the book. And it actually makes me very teary. I'm not going to tear up now. But we learned so much from our camp director. Our camp director when I was growing up, his name was Oscar Siegel. Uh, his wife had multiple sclerosis and his daughter had cystic fibrosis, his only daughter. And every single day we witnessed Oscar carrying Natalie 
down the stairs and putting her in the wheelchair. And every single day, if we wanted to meet with Oscar or if we called, were called to meet with Oscar, which was never a good sign, um, if those of you who are familiar with cystic fibrosis, you know, you have to loosen the mucus in the child's lungs. And, and he used to say, I can't talk right now, I'm clapping Renee. So we watched this selfless leader of ours with a very sick wife and a very sick daughter every single day of camp. And, and I, I, it, it taught us so much. And when I think about my camp friends in their 60s and 70s and 50s, so many of them went into medical professions and we talk about this, you know, uh, we have nurse practitioners, we have physicians, one of my good friends is an audiologist. Um, and we talk about the fact that we saw this powerful uh, healing, you know, and, and support systems. I mean, we were very conscious of medical situations every day of our lives. And I just, re you know, Matt, uh, Natalie, who um, had a very advanced stage of multiple sclerosis, was as bright as a whip. I mean, she was so, so smart. She just couldn't really move. And she talked with a very big stutter. Um, Renee died. She lived till 32, which was at that at that point, very uh, old for a cystic fibrosis uh, survivor. And then Oscar had a heart attack and he died. And Natalie outlived everyone by like 15 or 20 years. Natalie outlived them all. Uh, so Karen, that question is really important to me and I write about it. And it is something we witnessed every single day. And that was the selfless love and care and what, what a marriage really means, you know, through sickness and through health, uh, till death do we part. And, um, you know, I can't, I, and I say to my camp girls a lot, like till death do we part because we have been through a lot of stuff. One marriage, no, I still am on the same marriage, but you know, we're, we have a friend who's on marriage three and, we kind of, we say like, what would we do without each other through all this stuff, all this stuff, all this life? What would you do right now in your quarantines without being able to Zoom with your sister, who I Zoom with a lot, or my brother, or to talk to your college friends? And, and, get, and you know, now you don't really have anything else to do but to talk to your college friends. I had an hour conversation with someone I hadn't talked to for 20 years yesterday. I, I thought about her, but I didn't really have anything else to do. And we talked and we compared pictures and it was so lovely. So the power of stopping is really something that is helping us all in this unthinkable time of self-discovery. We have a um, question here. Uh, from Lauren. She says, I went to camp for 11 years and loved it. And she asks, what do you think about the trend of kids choosing to do more educational slash college oriented programs rather than camp? Love that question. I, I love, love, love that question. Um, I think being a camp counselor is better than an internship and I teach college. Um, you know, well, first of all, there's specialty camps. I mean, if, for those of you who have younger children, you can send your kid to a science camp. You can send your kid to a circus camp. You can send your kid to a math camp, or you can send your kid to a traditional camp like I went to, which offers everything. Um, I am shocked that we still get 27, 15, and 16-year-olds who've gone to camp for 10 and 11 years for their last year as the summer and I am so shocked that 95% of them, I'm not shocked, I understand it, it was me, I came back for two, to be a counselor. Um, I, I think that, per, well, you know what I'm gonna say. I mean, the experience of being at camp and being a camp counselor, where you're running things, you're in charge of young lives, you're in charge of inspiring, you're in charge of keeping kids safe. I mean, when you're an intern, you're following someone else's orders. When you're a camp counselor, you're running the show. And my first job right out of college at a public relations firm, um, the uh, interviewer, a very stern man, said, so tell me about your previous job experience. 
And the only job experience I had was I had been a waitress and I'd been a camp counselor. And I talked about both, you know, getting people, you know, uh, grumpy diners, their food on time with a smile and being 16 years, 18 years old and running a cabin of 16 year olds. I had the oldest cabin my last year. And I, and he said it was a real tribute to my work ethic and to my level of responsibility. I also told him I knew, knew CPR in case anyone dropped. Um, so I, I think if a kid wants to go back to camp and is gone for nine or 10 years and you've got a 16 or 17 year old and they're saying, mom, dad, I really wanna go back to camp and be with my friends and be a counselor. It's the best experience, in, and I would put it right on that job application, number one under job experience. It's nothing like it. So that's it for the questions. We have a lot of excellent comments that I don't have time to read all of them. Um, but I wanted to ask you, is there a difference between uh, camp for girls and camp for boys, and can camp girls be camp boys? Is, is that a similar experience? Well, I, you know, if I was, I tend to write from my own experience and my own heart, um, my books on marriage and motherhood and mothers and everything. Um, but I have never talked to a camp boy or a camp man who had a similar history like me, where you went repeatedly to the same camp. I mean, I, uh, one of my best friends owns our brother camp and, you know, five kids that he went to camp with were in his wedding. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, I mean, we could talk for years about, you know, men and women and different emotional uh, barometers and temperatures, but I think friendship is friendship and love is love. History is history and freezing together in a tent during a rainstorm when you're camping, trying to make a fire when all the wood is wet singing songs together in brotherly love or sisterly love. I mean, that's, there's nothing like it. But Tom, just because, you know, I, I need a humble brag here. Will you read me one comment? Oh, absolutely. Let's see. Uh, thank Terry. Terry here says he was too poor or he or she was too poor to go to summer camp. But when they grew up, they became a camp director when they were a college student. What a responsibility and a privilege. Oh, I love that. I love that. I love Jackie, that. Jackie says she's in tears right now as uh, her camp experience is such an important part of her life. Mm. Um, Terry again says it was hilarious that you called the waterfront director Beaver. I know. Well, I, I mean, it, I don't think that we would call her that now, but Beaver Swim. Um, but, but, oh boy, did she teach us to swim though. I mean, I did show you um, my yellow cap. By the way, this is not the best cap you could make. You could make a purple cap. And I think in all of Camp Agawak's 100-year um, history, there's only been 20 purple caps. Wow. But, you know, you look at all that stuff you learned at camp. I mean, I could still swim a pretty perfect breaststroke and maybe shoot and maybe not a bullseye in archery but i can definitely get on the target and you know the resourcefulness and the versatility but we didn't even talk about inclusion you know i mean once you go to camp and people you're with strangers and they're all different than you and you just become a person that can you know you want to be able to get along with everybody because you did it as a kid without mommy around you know you did it and kids were different and you might have had squabbles, but you worked it out. Campers turn into adults who can deal. I have a, one more question for you before we wrap it up. And I, I was just curious, when you were at camp, were you there for the moon landing? When was the moon landing? Uh, 69. I was at camp the summer of 69. I was in cabin 15. But you know what? Uh, I don't think there were, we didn't watch television. I, I was probably, you know, in the lake. Mm. Is that your, is that your question? Or is that That's my the, question. Yeah, I was curious. Why would, yeah, no, you might remember the moon landing. I remember it like, you know, from seeing a uh, film of it later, but I can tell you this and any camper of our 208 people around the campfire right now 
No, is that we probably weren't thinking about the moon landing uh, because we were at camp giggling with our friends and, you know, eating food that we had snuck into our cabin. Uh, and we're not allowed to have candy, but we all did. And uh, this has been so much fun. And I, I can't thank you all enough for coming. I know that uh, you have very busy schedules now. Do I go to my kitchen or do I go to my living room or do I watch Netflix? But tonight you watched me and Tom, thank you so much for making this happen. And to all my camp friends out there, my new friends and people who didn't go to camp, I hope the summer works out for you to be a summer of fun and a summer of safety and a summer of love. Thank you so much, Iris. And thank everyone you. everyone watching, uh, please click on the green button to purchase Camp Girls. You won't regret it. Uh, oh, and yeah, if you want I have to show you the book. I want to show yeah. you. Here's the book. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, smooth. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. And there's a bunch of girls jumping in the water. That's us. Thank All right, you. well, yeah, on behalf of everyone from Politics and Pros, thank you so much, Iris, and uh, have a good night, everyone. <laughs>